The problem of increasing human energy, with special references to the harnessing of the sun's energy, by Nikola Tesla, Century Illustrated Magazine, June 1900. Great possibilities offered by iron for increasing human performance. Enormous waste in iron manufacture. Iron is by far the most important factor in modern progress. It contributes more than any other industrial product to the force accelerating human movement. So general is the use of this metal, and so intimately is it connected with all that concerns our life, that it has become as indispensable to us as the very air we breathe. Its name is as synonymous with usefulness, but however great the influence of iron may be on the present human development, it does not add to the force urging man onward nearly as much as it might. First of all, its manufacture does now carried on is connected with an appalling waste of fuel, that is, waste of energy. Then again, only a part of all that iron produced is applied for useful purposes. A good part of it goes to create frictional resistances, while still another large part is the means of developing negative forces greatly retarded in human movement. Thus, the negative force of war is almost wholly represented in iron. It is impossible to estimate with any degree of accuracy the magnitude of this greatest of all retarding forces, but it is certainly very considerable. If the present positive impelling force due to all useful applications of iron be represented by 10, for instance, I should not think it an exaggeration to estimate the negative force of war with due consideration of all its retarding influences and results at, say, 6. On the basis of this estimate, the effective impelling force of iron in the positive direction would be measured by the difference of these two numbers, which is 4. But if... Through the establishment of universal peace, the manufacturer of war machinery should cease, and all struggle for supremacy between nations should be turned into healthful, ever active, and productive commercial competition. Then the positive impelling force due to iron would be measured by the sum of those two numbers, which is 16. That is, the force would have four times its present value. This example is, of course, merely intended to give an idea of the immense increase in the useful performance of mankind which would result from a radical reform of the iron industries supplying the implements of warfare. A similar inestimable advantage in the saving of energy available to man would be secured by obviating the great waste of coal which is inseparably connected with the present methods of manufacturing iron. In some countries, such as Great Britain, the hurtful effects of this squandering of fuel are beginning to be felt. The price of coal is constantly rising, and the poor are made to suffer more and more. Though we are still far from the dreaded exhaustion of the coal fields, philanthropy commands us to invent novel methods of manufacturing iron, which will not involve such barbarous waste of this valuable material from which we derive at present most of our energy. It is our duty to coming generations to leave this store of energy intact for them, or at least not to touch it until we shall have perfected processes for burning coal more efficiently. Those who are coming after us will need fuel more than we do. We should be able to manufacture the iron we require by using the sun's energy without wasting any coal at all. As an effort to this end, the idea of smelting iron ores by electric currents obtained from the energy of falling water has naturally suggested itself to many. I have, myself, spent much time in endeavoring to evolve such a practical process, which would enable iron to be manufactured at a small cost. After a prolonged investigation of the subject, finding that it was unprofitable to use the currents generated directly for smelting the ore, I devised a method which is far more economical. Economical production of iron by a new process. The industrial project, as I worked it out six years ago, contemplated the employment of the electric currents derived from the energy of a waterfall. Not directly for smelting the ore, but for decomposing water for a preliminary step. To lessen the cost of the plant, I proposed to generate the currents in exceptionally cheap and simple dynamos, which I designed for this sole purpose. The hydrogen liberated in the electrolytic decomposition was to be burned or recombined with oxygen, not with that from which it was separated, but with that of the atmosphere. Thus, very nearly the total electrical energy used up in the decomposition of the water would be recovered in the form of heat, resulting from the recombination of the hydrogen. 
The heat was to be applied to the smelting ore. The oxygen gained as a byproduct of the decomposition of the water I intended to use for certain industrial purposes, which would probably yield good financial returns inasmuch as this is the cheapest way of obtaining this gas in large quantities. In any event, it could be employed to burn all kinds of refuge, cheap hydrocarbon or coal of the most inferior quality which could not be burned in air or otherwise utilized to advantage, and thus again a considerable amount of heat would be made available for the smelting of the ore. To increase the economy of the process I contemplated furthermore, using an arrangement such that the hot metal and the products of combustion coming out the furnace would give up their heat upon the cold ore going into the furnace, so that comparatively little of the heat energy would be lost in the smelting. I calculated that probably 40,000 pounds of iron could be produced per horsepower per annum by this method. Liberal allowances were made for those losses which were unavoidable, the above quantity being about half of that theoretically obtainable. Relying on this estimate and on practical data with reference to a certain kind of sand ore existing in abundance in the region of the Great Lakes, including cost of transportation and labor, I found that in some localities, iron could be manufactured in this manner cheaper than by any of the adopted methods. This result will be obtained all the more surely if the oxygen obtained from the water, instead of being used for smelting of ore, as assumed, should be more profitably employed. Any new demand for this gas would secure a high revenue for the plant, thus cheapening the iron. This project advanced merely in the interest of industry. Someday, I hope, a beautiful industrial butterfly will come out of the dusty and shriveled chrysalis. The production of iron from sand ores by a process of a magnetic separation is highly commendable in principle, since it involves no waste of coal but the usefulness of this method is largely reduced by the necessity of melting the iron afterward. As to the crushing of iron ore, I would consider it rational only if done by water power or by energy otherwise obtained without consumption of fuel. An electrolytic cold process which would make it possible to extract iron cheaply and also to mold it into the required forms without any fuel consumption would, in my opinion, be a very great advance in iron manufacture. In common with some other metals, iron has so far resisted electrolytic treatment, but there could be no doubt that such a cold process will ultimately replace metallurgy, the present crude method of casting, and thus obviating the enormous waste of fuel necessitated by the repeated heating of metal in the foundries. Up to a few decades ago, the usefulness of iron was based almost wholly on its remarkable mechanical properties. But since the advent of the commercial dynamo and electric motor, its value to mankind has been greatly increased by its unique magnetic qualities. As regards the latter, iron has been greatly improved of late. The signal progress began about 13 years ago when I discovered that in using soft Bessemer steel instead of wrought iron as then customary in an alternating motor, the performance of the machine was doubled. I brought this fact to the attention of Mr. Albert Schmid, to whose untiring efforts and ability is largely due to the supremacy of American electrical machinery, and who was then superintendent of an industrial corporation engaged in this field. Following my suggestion, he constructed transformers of steel and then showed the same marked improvement. The investigation was then systematically conditioned under Mr. Schmid's guidance, the impurities being gradually eliminated from the steel, which was only such a name for in reality it was pure soft iron, and soon a product resulted which admitted of little further improvement.